Thank you very much for joining me for part two of this presentation on the Rainbow Portrait. As usual, a fully illustrated PDF version of the presentation is available by clicking the link on the YouTube page. Please download it as it has the full text and the images. There is a bibliography of the sources used for both parts at the end of the PDF. In part one, we looked at some elements of the portrait, including its history. Then we studied the headdress, the face and the clothes that the Queen is wearing. In this part, we look at the emblems on her left arm and the rainbow symbol, and then try to come to some conclusions as to what it all means. Let's start with the left sleeve. The design of the left sleeve has stimulated much thought and discussion over the years. Here is an enlarged view on which are displayed three items – a snake, an armillary sphere and a heart-shaped ruby. Let's take each in turn. First, the ruby heart. There are two contemporary accounts which may explain how the Queen came into possession of it. In 1595, Prior to the wedding of Elizabeth de Vere, that's Edward de Vere's eldest daughter, to William Stanley, Earl of Derby, Arthur Throckmorton wrote to William Cecil announcing that he planned to present the Queen with a heart-shaped ruby to appease her wrath at the marriage of his sister Elizabeth to Sir Walter Raleigh. Secondly, following the visit of the Queen to Harefield in 1602, Sir George Saville wrote a heart-shaped jewel was presented to the Queen. The figure of time explained how it had been stolen from a goddess and it was offered to her as a pledge and mirror of their hearts which were indebted to her. So she might have just wanted to wear it as a symbol of love for her subjects. Nothing so simple, I'm afraid, as you're about to find out. Another explanation may lie in the term wearing your heart on your sleeve, as spoken by Iago in Othello. The origin of the saying probably arose from medieval jousting, when a knight would wear an item belonging to a lady as a token of affection, demonstrating openness and honesty. The upper arm protection, the rerebrace, brace was originally referred to as a sleeve. Also note that the lance was held in the right arm, a shield if used was held in the left. And I'll come back to that later. Many authors have observed that the ruby hangs from the snake's jaws. As you can see, this is not true. If anything, it appears to be superglued to the undersurface of the tongue, just as the armillary sphere is balanced on its head. Even at the limit of resolution, the situation is no clearer. The problem is whether or not to consider the heart and armillary sphere as separate and independent from the snake emblem or part of it. The artist was certainly not short of space to separate the items if he'd wanted to. So I propose that we consider them as part of the same message by their proximity. And we need to dig a little deeper to understand why. It's fair to say that disembodied hearts are fairly common in emblem books. They seem to have all sorts of adventures. There are, however, none that I can find dangling from a snake's tongue, nor pinned to a garment. If we're not careful, scouring the vast emblem books can lead to some confusion, as it's easy to come across something which might just unlock the meaning of your puzzle. Here is an example. This is from Valeriano's book on sacred Egyptian hieroglyphs of 1575. The image is strange indeed, showing a man with breasts and a heart on a chain around his neck. The text speaks of great orators such as Cicero and St Paul, who spoke from the heart, giving wise counsel. So the implication is that the heart emblem may link back to the Egyptians. This is from Reaper's 1611 version of Iconologia and is entitled Concilio or Council. The man has a book in one hand, an owl in the other and a heart on a chain round his neck. He speaks from his heart of wisdom and learning. So that seems to fit nicely. 
However, this is from the 1625 edition of Reaper's work and entitled Eletione, or Choice. A woman sits with an oak tree on her right and a serpent on her left. She wears a heart around her neck and is holding a banner with the words Virtutum Eligo, I choose power. She's looking down at the snake and she's pointing to the tree. The text tells us that her experience lends her to make a true choice. The tree symbolises virtue in that its leaves are used to crown valiant captains, i.e. a prize for heroism. So I understand about the heart and wise counsel, but what about the snake? Presumably he's not virtuous. And I'm not sure what you make of it, but he looks to me to be in a pretty bad way. Confused? Unfortunately, it gets worse. Here is the icon from Cesare Reaper's Iconologia from 1603. It is labelled Intelligenza, together with the text of the 1709 version, which summarises the Italian version. A woman in a gold crepe gown, crowned with a garland of flowers, a sphere in one hand and a serpent in the other. The gown shows that she should always be splendid and precious like gold. The sphere and serpent referring to her knowledge and understanding of the celestial world and the natural one. The last two icons appear to conflict with one another as to the symbolism of the snake. Little doubt, I think, that whoever commissioned the painting, however, had knowledge of this particular icon. As in the other examples, it's important to view the icon as a whole. In this context, this is the subject who is intelligent, and it may be interpreted that the armillary sphere and the snake symbolise the breadth of her knowledge from celestial to lowly creeping life. The garland of flowers, her knowledge of the botanical world, which is the, in the portrait is expressed in the flowers of the jacket. Unfortunately, the most common interpretation of the snake-heart combination in the portrait is this. The snake is a symbol of wisdom, therefore we have a wise snake giving good counsel from the heart. This raises the issue of how the snake became wise and why would it be giving good counsel. If it's meant to signify that the queen speaks from the heart, why isn't the heart incorporated into the jewellery around her neck, like the other emblem books? Could the snake be present for an entirely different reason? I think it might. In order to try and understand this, we need to take a fairly large detour to talk about snakes. So bear with me, the reason will become evident. The first thing to say is that snakes and serpents are the same and can be used interchangeably. So for our purposes, I'll stick with snake, unless quoting from the source material. In order to understand the relationship between man and snakes, we need to go right back to the Egyptians. They both dreaded and were filled with awe by their lethal capabilities and apparent rejuvenation by shedding their skins. As a result, they chose to both repel and revere them in their daily lives. The Egyptians divided those snakes into four groups, symbols of chaos, symbols of healing, symbols of eternity, and symbols of protection. First, chaos. Apophis was the snake which embodied darkness and chaos, emerging from the primordial waters at the beginning of time. It lived in the underworld and was, was responsible for evil at every level of society. It was the nemesis of Ra, the sun god, with whom it battled constantly. Apophis was usually described as a large snake with multiple coils. It was often shown being dismembered in an attempt to destroy it, in this case by Ra in the shape of a cat, who curiously seems to have rabbit ears, only to rise again from the pieces. Mythology pervaded the minds of the Egyptians and venomous snakes came to embody villainy. Next, healing. The Egyptians sought to employ the dangerous aspects of the snake deities for their own benefit by producing magical texts and images imploring them for protection. Magic was a legitimate source of power and was employed alongside medicine, particularly in the treatment of snake bites. And they did this with the use of a recitation and amulets by a priest doctor. 
The serpent's staff was used as a magical tool to enable the magician to perform his deeds. This image shows Thoth holding two staffs intertwined with snakes bearing the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Next, eternity. Alongside healing, the snake was also perceived to represent rejuvenation and rebirth. This is the second gilded shrine of Tutankhamun from around 1300 BC. The figure of the mummy is shown in the centre, with two obvious rings around the head and the legs. In each is shown a snake which is eating its tail. This is the first recorded occurrence of the symbol Ouroboros, presenting rebirth and renewal. It has since been taken up and adapted in many ways. And lastly, protection. The most well-known example of a protective snake is the Uraeus, shown here on the right of the Mask of Tutankhamun. Fear of the cobra turned into an ideal symbol of power for the Egyptian pharaohs who wanted their enemies to fear them as they feared the serpent. The pose adopted by the snake is important and it's shown well in this example of Isis and Osiris with the griffin of the goddess Nemesis between them. The snake is always shown with the body coiled and as you can see by the one on the right it is not always a cobra. Egyptian beliefs filtered down through Greek and Roman history to Renaissance Europe, modified to suit the political and religious climate as they went. This is the 1811 edition of another work by Horopolo, whom you may remember decoded hieroglyphs in the 5th century. The work was translated into English by Alexander Turner Corey. Each item is entitled How They, that's the Egyptians, denote various things. And here is the page denoting eternity. The text is in both Greek and English. On the left is a snake believed to be eternal because of its ability to shed its skin. On the right is the Uraeus with its body coiled, said to be able to kill with a single glance. It was believed to be immortal, hence its use on the head of the pharaoh. This image is from the 1551 edition of Hieroglyphica. It is entitled How They Signified the World. The snake is shown eating its tail and the text reads And the making use of its body for food implies that all things whatsoever that are generated in the world by divine providence undergo a corruption into it. By shedding its skin each year it renews itself, putting off old age. In this depiction, the snake is shown as a double loop, which I will come back to later. Nowhere in any of the accounts is a reference to the intelligence of snakes. A small point, but a relevant one, as you will see shortly. In the Bible, snakes do figure occasionally. This from the Geneva edition in Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And in Matthew 10, 17, Behold, I send sheep into the midst of the wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Interestingly, the word wise is replaced by sly and shrewd, and in other versions as crafty when translated into plain English from the Aramaic. So the conclusion seems to be that the word wise was used in a negative way. In the 19th century, attempts were made to critically evaluate the Hebrew and Chaldee languages, that's Aramaic. Wilhelm Gesenius, on the left, led the way with epic works of a thesaurus and a lexicon, and his work was translated by Samuel Prido Tregellis, a Cornishman. Both were clergymen. Tregellis confidently states that the serpent among the ancient Hebrews and among the Egyptians was the symbol of wisdom and healing power, for which four biblical references were given. I spent a rather frustrating couple of hours tracing them. One didn't exist and the other three just mentioned fiery flying serpents. Snakes then turned up in the bestiaries. This one is from the Aberdeen version, is in the process of shedding its skin. 
the accompanying text follows the principles of the Egyptian views on snakes with a Christian flavour, but there's no mention of intelligence. In order to try a different approach, we need to take a brief look at snakes in heraldry. In fact, there are three forms of the snake in heraldry, the snake gnawed or knotted, glissant or creeping, and erect. I can find no difference in significance between them, and they seem to be used interchangeably. Now let's return to our snake. The question is how we interpret its shape. It would have been much simpler just to have a wavy snake all in one plane. The coiling of the snake is therefore highly likely to be of some significance. So does the snake have a heraldic message? You can see that it stands out on the left. It is edged in gold and has three rows of precious stones, the size of which varies depending on the diameter of the creature at that point. They consist of pearls and diamonds, pearls and rubies, pearls and black stones. Janet Arnold, in her great work on Elizabeth I's wardrobe, makes reference to a jewel of gold like a snake, wound together with small opals and rubies. This was in an inventory from 1600, so the item probably did exist. And the snake is green. Snakes were a common element of charges on coats of arms, i.e. they were sighted within the shield, and the colour may indicate that this was a grass snake. The obvious thing is that the snake has a knot in it, and this is consistent with it being a heraldic emblem. If you pull on the head and the tail of the gnawed snake, you will arrive at a shape very close to that shown in the image. Referring back to medieval armour, the snake could represent the rerebrace, brace, which as we saw protected the left upper arm. Does the snake have its origins in Egyptian iconography? Well, although the snake is not a cobra, the way in which it is coiled does have similarities to the uraeus, the ultimate symbol of sovereignty, royalty, divine authority and supremacy. This is an image from the 1599 version of Horopolo's Hieroglyphica, the symbol of renewal and rebirth, with the snake shown in a never-ending double loop. Very similar, in fact, to the symbol for infinity. In fact, this was not described until some 50 years later by John Wallace, but almost certainly was known before this time. I propose that the snake is a heraldic protective symbol, laden with the attributes of the Egyptian Uraeus for power, wealth, protection and divinity. The closed loop designs occur in the headdress, the ruff and jewellery, symbolising eternity and renewal. The heart? Well, I think that the simplest explanation is that it's worn on the sleeve, symbolising openness and honesty in the way that the monarch's attributes are deployed. Just one final point, there is something else of note. This is not the first time a snake appeared on a painting of the Queen. This is a portrait by an unknown artist from the 1580s. The damaged original on the left showed the Queen holding a bunch of white roses and was examined by infrared, revealing the remnants of a snake. An artist's impression of what the original may have looked like is shown on the right, it was removed during the final stages of painting, which may well have been because of its evil connotations. Why then was it acceptable to include it into the rainbow portrait in such a prominent position? I think because it's not a real snake, it's a symbolic one. Now let's look at the armillary sphere. I want to present some very interesting and indeed beautiful examples of how the sphere was portrayed in Elizabethan art and crafts, which I hope may give you an understanding of how it came to be included in the portrait. As I've mentioned, the armillary sphere appears to be almost balancing on the snake's head. And if we look at an even larger image, there is no chain above it, just a small golden sphere which may be the head of a pin. We must assume that this was how it was attached to the fabric of the sleeve. 
The armillary sphere was a type of celestial globe invented by Greek astronomers in around 200 BC to assist in observation of the movement of the stars. It was further developed by Islamic astrologers and introduced into Islamic Spain around 1000 AD. It was a Ptolemaic view of the universe with the earth at its centre. By the Renaissance it became an ultimate symbol of wisdom and knowledge. It was known to have been used by Anne Boleyn and was later adopted as an emblem by Queen Elizabeth. Interestingly, although Copernicus published his work on the heliocentric universe in 1543, the armillary sphere as an icon remained true to the Ptolemaic version right up to the 17th century. It appeared in a Psalter, which the then Princess Elizabeth gave to an unknown recipient. The poem, thought to have been written by her, reads as follows. No crooked leg, no bleared eye, no part deformed out of kind, nor yet so ugly half can be, as is this inward suspicious mind. On the opposite page is an armillary sphere, girded by the signs of the zodiac and standing on the book entitled Verbum Domini, the Word of God. The Italian motto below reads, Wretched is he who puts hope in mortal things. The emblem is clearly being used in a religious context. The truth of the word of God in the Bible is supporting his creation, the universe. During the Queen's reign, the symbol began to appear in her courtiers. This is Sir Henry Lee, painted by Antonius Moore in 1568. Sir Henry was the Queen's master of horse and inaugurated the annual Accession Day tilt. He was responsible for the complex choreography and allegorical symbolism that surrounded it until his retirement in 1590. On his sleeves are obvious armillary spheres together with true lover's knots in deference to the monarch. This remarkably beautiful tapestry was woven in 1585 for the new house on the strand of Robert Dudley. It bears his coat of arms and his motto, right and loyal. There's something else about it. If you look closely at the borders, there are armillary spheres. On the sides, they're supported by figures and along the top and bottom are simply woven into the design. In total, there are 69 spheres around the edges of the design. As a show of loyalty to the Queen, it was certainly some statement. The armillary sphere began to appear in other places associated with emblems of the Queen. This is the quadrangle of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, with its sundial erected in 1581. At the top is the pelican in her piety, standing on an armillary sphere both emblems of the Queen. This is perhaps the strangest place to find the sphere on an embroidery by Mary Queen of Scots while she was imprisoned at Tutbury, the home of the Earl of Shrewsbury. The scene is of an armillary sphere shedding feathers onto a sea full of ships. In the four corners are the arms of France, Scotland, Spain and England. The Spanish inscription reads Sorrows pass, but hope survives. The surrounding emblems symbolise courage under adversity and fidelity. The theme is of a great alliance between the countries, with Mary as Queen. Many of Mary's creations were thought to be ambiguous, and the armillary sphere may signify Elizabeth disappearing below the waves. This is thought to be either Dorothy Huddleston or Lady Denman, painted in the 1590s. It is the black and gold design of her stomacher which is interesting. There are two armillary spheres, the lower of which is somewhat squashed, and there are two spirals of fabric. If we enlarge it, we can see two coiled snakes, partly hidden, one of which is draped around a miniature of the Queen attached to the garment by a red bow. Note also the black bows in the floral design set against a white background, black and white being the Queen's colours. So once again we have the combination of our millery spheres, snakes and flowers, which together with other elements pay homage to the Queen. 
In this portrait from the 1580s, the Queen herself is shown with large embroidered armillary spheres on her sleeves, together with intertwining heart-shaped emblems, symbolic of lovers' knots. This portrait of the Queen, which is by an unknown artist, hangs in Reading, Berkshire, and it has armillary spheres as part of the pattern of the dress, but you have to look hard to see them. There are six in total, and here they are. And this is the Ditchley portrait of the Queen by Marcus Gearhart the Younger, presented to her during a visit to the home of Sir Henry Lee in 1592. Hanging from her hair is an armillary sphere tied with a red ribbon, and she wears the crescent moon design of the goddess Diana over her forehead. By this stage, the Queen was being portrayed as a cosmic force. She stands atop the globe and appears to be in control of the elements. This is George Clifford III, Earl of Cumberland, in a miniature by Nicholas Hilliard in the early 1590s. He replaced Sir Henry Lee as the Queen's champion and is shown in jousting gear with gauntlets thrown down as if in challenge perhaps reflecting back to the gauntlet pinned to the Queen's collar. On the lining of his sleeves are armillary spheres and olive branches. He is sporting the Queen's glove pinned to his hat, which bears a similar decoration. There is something else about the hat which I'll come back to later. This is the title page of John Case's Sphera Civitatis, the sphere of state, which was a commentary on Aristotle's politics. It does, however, give a remarkable insight into the complex myth which had been created around the Virgin Queen. The Queen embraces the universe from above. She is defender of her nations, her attributes, majesty, justice, fortitude, religion, clemency, eloquence and abundance are displayed for all to see. Under her realm come the planets and stars, and at the centre of it is the earth, governed by immovable justice. From very simple beginnings, the armillary sphere had become an emblem of her power. Now, who might have been behind this remarkable transformation? I think we need look no further than Sir Henry Lee, he was responsible for the popularisation of the armillary sphere as a royal emblem. It began with her courtiers displaying as loyalty to her and then grew into a wearable icon for the Queen herself. Sir Henry was a great sponsor of Marcus Gearhart's, commissioning many paintings from him during the 1590s to furnish his house in Oxfordshire. This portrait was created around 1600, indicating that they were still in contact at around the time that the rainbow portrait was painted. This is a sonnet which was written to Sir Henry by William Seagar in 1597. For our purposes, it's the border which is of interest. It shows snakes, olive branches and armillary spheres. As much as the words, this design was a tribute to the man. So if someone wanted to design and paint a definitive portrait of the Queen at the end of her reign, who might have had the vision to produce it? I would suggest Lee and Gearhart's. There is another dimension to the armillary sphere. In 2006, Jean Wilson published an article entitled Queen Elizabeth I as Urania. Now who in the universe might she be? Well, Urania was originally a Greek goddess, muse of astronomy and astrology, and was usually pictured with a celestial globe and a short stick with which she pointed. She was incorporated into Roman culture, as shown here in a war painting from Pompeii. By the Renaissance, her link to the armillary sphere was well appreciated and politically useful. Added to Urania's talents, was muse to Christian Protestant poetry. Urania was also a mathematical figure, signifying higher learning. This is the frontispiece to Robert Record's The Castle of Knowledge, published in 1556 under the reign of Queen Mary. Here is a castle enthroned by Mary at the top, 
and below are two emblems. On the right, the Wheel of Fortune, whose ruler is ignorance, shown blindfolded. On the left is the Armillary Sphere of Destiny, whose governor is knowledge in the form of Urania. The explanatory text reads, Though spiteful fortune turned her wheel to stay the sphere of Urani, yet doth this sphere resist that wheel and fleeth all fortune's villainy. Though earth do honour fortune's ball and by tells blind her wheel advance, the heavens to fortune are not thrall, these spheres surmount all fortune's chance. The Queen as Urania is further supported by this embroidered silk panel from around 1600, which may have been created for her. It is extraordinarily complex and full of emblems and allegory, and I'll just point out some of its features. It's divided into several zones. There is a cosmic one with stars and thunderbolts, an earthly one reaching towards heaven, and a lower earthly one. Right in the centre is this. At the top, an angel surmounted by a heart pierced by an arrow, and below this, the figure of astrology, i.e. Urania, complete with wand and armillary sphere. Bottom left is what I think is a mechanism of the earth with water heated in the underworld and then condensed into the clouds and falling as rain, giving life to plants, and in this case pansies, and also parrots. In the right-hand corner is an armillary sphere suspended by a hand from the clouds, symbolising that the earth is governed by rules of the universe as defined by God. Scattered throughout the piece are pansies, roses, lilies, carnations and fritillaries. Urania had one more trick up her sleeve. She was also Aphrodite Urania, who represented sacred love as opposed to Aphrodite Pandemnos, literally for the people, who represented profane love, adding another dimension of Elizabeth as the goddess of love to add to that of defender of the Protestant church and the bringer of wisdom and peace. In summary then, the Queen is the symbol of intelligentsia, dressed in gold, displaying knowledge and power over the universe, represented by the armillary sphere and the natural world of plants represented by the jacket, right down to animals that crawl as represented by the snake. The Queen as Urania, muse of astronomy, emphasises her knowledge of mathematics, astrology and alchemy, as well as symbolising sacred love. We've seen from the Egyptian hieroglyphs that snakes were seen in several ways as a symbol of renewal by shedding their skin each year, as a symbol of eternity through the concept of the Ouroboros, and lastly in the form of Uraeus, standing for power, wealth, protection and divinity. The various forms of closed loops seen in the jewellery elsewhere in the portrait, derived from the Ouroboros, echo this eternity theme. The protective element may be emphasised by the heraldic posture of the snake and the fact that it's a separate item, worn fixed to the left arm like a piece of armour. The heart jewel, worn on her sleeve, emphasises her openness and honesty. The physical link of the snake with the armillary sphere and the heart jewel may be interpreted as all three elements linked together in defence of the Queen's achievements. Now it's time to look at the rainbow, after which the portrait has been named. It's not known when the title was applied, but it's fair to say that it is the largest and most visible icon in the work. It's possible to manipulate the image to bring out some features of the rainbow structure. On the left it appears to fade out before the edge of the canvas. If we lighten this area you can see that it does extend to the edge, although it fades into blackness. In other words, there was not a deliberate attempt to truncate it and seems to extend into another dimension outside the picture frame. If we darken the image, you can clearly see the tube-like structure with a prominent white highlight running along its length. 
You can also see that it's translucent, with the underlying flower being visible through it, and of course the gold of the underlying fabric. At the right end it merges into the Queen's clothes to become part of them. The obvious thing of all is that the rainbow is colourless. You could argue that the colours have been faded over time. But most experts believe this is highly unlikely, as the remainder of the paintwork in the portrait is so vivid. What I've done here is to saturate the red, yellow, green and blue colours to see if there is any residual coloured stripes, and as you can see there are none. The colours shown are merely those of the underlying clothes. The next thing is the position of the hand. How exactly would you hold a rainbow? One might suppose to gently support it with an open, upturned palm. What you see here is biomechanically the power grip of the hand. The wrist is dorsiflexed, which winds up the flexor tendons of the forearm to amplify their power. In other words, the Queen is hanging on to it. Just to emphasise the point, here is the grip compared to that taken from the statue of Diana, which resides in the Vatican Museum. You can see that they are both gripping the bow. Now let's look at the inscription. It is in Latin and sits just above the rainbow to which it refers. The words are non sine sole iris. The first question to address is whether or not there is any message hidden in the arrangement or lettering of the text. The letters are capitalised, but the letters N S and I are larger. It's probably not significant. Two are proper names, which were often written as larger letters, and the third is the first word of the sentence. All the letters of the word iris are 10% larger than those of the first line. And the first I has a dot over it, which is unusual. It appears rather odd that the text is in two lines. You can see from this view that there would have been space to use a single line. And yes, the text is not level, which would have made it even more evident if the line had been longer. Now, I'm not a Latin scholar, so please correct me if I'm wrong on the following points. The Latin word non means not, there being no word for no in Latin. There are no articles such as the and a in Latin, the context governs the translation. Word order in the sentence can be used to emphasise a particular word. Read literally, the words read as not without sun rainbow. The usual translation is no rainbow without the sun. But this could also be not a rainbow without the sun. Now this is not unreasonable and in our context makes more sense because what the Queen is holding is no longer a rainbow. Now there are two words in Latin which signify rainbow, arcus and iris. The former also refers to a bow, as in bow and arrows, and an arch. Now just suppose someone decided to use iris instead of arcus and then to move iris to the end of the text and make it larger to emphasise it, with a dot over the eye for good measure, and then put it under the word sine. Now here's my suggestion. Iris is not just a rainbow, she is the goddess Iris, messenger of the gods. So another interpretation could be no iris without the sun, the significance of which you will find out shortly. This may be nothing, but it struck me that there are three letters I close together forming a triangle within which sits an R. Could this be an example of the Queen's closest to the Trinity, R representing Regina? This book by Henry Hawkins, a Jesuit priest, was published 30 years after the Rainbow Portrait. Remember, of course, that many of these emblems were well known before the collections were published. It was entitled The Mysterious and Delicious Garden of the Sacred Virgins in honour of Mary, the Mother of God. 
it gives us an idea of how the rainbow was viewed. You can see it here arching over the sea in the distance. And here is the device entitled the iris, which is depicted arching from the clouds and framed by two sawfish, a type of ray. In the accompanying text, the rainbow is described as the bow of heaven, the fairest dress of nature. It lives in and by the air, but has its only substance in the eye. It is the fair and goodly mirror of the heavenly intelligences, which they will gaze on. If the angels were to lay aside their wings and go afoot, I do not think they would have a better way to descend or ascend, but by this causeway. They say it is nothing in itself, which if it be, it is a pretty nothing. That so with nothing should make the heaven so beautiful, nay more, so rich and all with nothing. So the rainbows were thought to be a heavenly way of getting about. Later in the discourse, the writer quotes Genesis 9.16 from the Geneva Bible. Therefore the bow shall be in the cloud, that I may see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living thing in all flesh that is upon the earth. And no marvel surely since the bow he regards, so much is the symbol of his dearest mother, the incomparable virgin. The colours of the rainbow are then described to have been given to all the elements of nature by the Virgin Mary. Further on in the book is this extraordinary exposition of the usefulness of rainbows. Jesus is on the cross, God the Father is in heaven and the Virgin Mary is on a cloud. The sinner is praying on earth. The text is as follows. From heaven the Father sees his Son below, upon the cross as on a cloud a bow, when vapours from the earth exhaled arise. The mother likewise sees with morning eyes her son all black and blue, pale and wan and red, green with a crown of thorned fixed upon his head. At which reflect and by selection die the mother like a rainbow in the sky. To her for mercy when the sinner sues, the son his mother as a rainbow views, that pleads for mercy to her son's appeal, who signs the pardon and his wounds are sealed. It's hard not to consider this as an internet of rainbows. In 1622, Claude Paradin published his collection of heroic devices and emblems. And here we can see the same elements used for another purpose in this case to eulogise the late Catherine de' Medici, wife of Henri II and mother of two further kings. She lived between 1519 and 1589 and she had a long and complex relationship with Elizabeth, principally over the possible marriage of one of her sons and the persecution of Protestants. Worshipped in France, Elizabeth had great respect for her statesmanship. The text describes the use of the celestial ark or ark in the sky as emblematic of her, the very sign of clear serenity and tranquillity of peace. On the left is a stained glass window at the Chateau de Couen de dedicated to her. On the right is a detail showing the rainbow and the motto, the rainbow brings fair weather. As we've learned from previous presentations, Elizabeth assumed ideas and useful qualities from other prominent figures, either contemporary or historical. She's done this with the rainbow. There is one more thing we need to look at before pulling it all together, and that is the name Iris. As I've mentioned, Iris was a messenger of the gods and not surprisingly moved about on rainbows. She's also associated with new endeavours. The personification of the rainbow was considered by the Greeks as a link between the heaven and earth. She was also believed to aid in the fulfilment of human prayers. Here she is on the right with the goddess Hera, taken from a 5th century BC lekythos, which was an oil jar. She carries a caduceus, the symbol of a messenger, and the pitcher of water for the gods. Her role as messenger was later assumed by Hermes, and memory of her has faded. 
Ovid in Metamorphosis 14 tells us how Iris followed Hera's instruction to glide down her many-coloured rainbow to earth and aid the widow of Romulus to become a goddess. Now let's return for a moment to the painting of George Clifford, 3rd Earl of Cumberland in his jousting gear. Quite clearly on his hat are two caduceus which I think supports the link between the Queen and Iris. Iris, of course, makes an appearance in The Tempest during the mask in Scene 4, Act 1. She provides a calming influence on the excitement of the mask through her disdain of lustful powers such as the goddess Venus. One interpretation is that Iris functions to show how nature can provide the bridge for humanity to solve its problems. For example, this scene blesses the marriage between Miranda and Ferdinand, which unites the two families after years of conflict. What have we learned? Well, it's fair to say that what we've looked at is fairly wide-ranging and allows us to answer a number of questions. However, there remains much ambiguity and indeed mystery. Why was the painting commissioned? Ostensibly, the work was to celebrate the achievements of Gloriana, everything that the Virgin Queen stood for and achieved. Who commissioned it? Not known for certain. That person would have had to have had a broad understanding of classical mythology and the literature of the day, some of which had not yet been translated into English. It is likely that this person defined every element of the work. Unlikely, I think, to have been Robert Cecil. He was an administrator rather than a classical scholar. I suspect it may have been Sir Henry Lee, well versed in emblems and symbolism, who worked closely with the artist and possibly others. Was it ever given to the Queen? This is uncertain. There are two royal visits during the last year of the Queen's reign, one to Sir Thomas Egerton at Harefield in July of 1602 and the other to Sir Robert Cecil in December of 1602. There's no direct evidence that it was shown on these occasions. What are the messages? Well, the first thing to realise is the painting is highly allegorical, it lies outside time and encompasses all the Virgin Queen stood for. Overall, it shows Elizabeth as the sun. The lighting is flat, the background, her palace is irrelevant, she is self-illuminating. The face is ageless, she is beautiful, confident and looks straight into your eye. She wears an imperial closed crown and her jewellery signals untold wealth and she is adorned by emblems from history and contemporary figures. Right at the start, I mentioned that it would be useful to ask ourselves if the elements of the portrait were religious, political or ambiguous. I think we now have enough information to do just that. First, religion and faith, which I'm going to take in its widest sense, to include elements which engender faith in the Queen. She is presented with links to many mythical individuals and the literature of the time referred to her as being the physical embodiment of them. She is the returning Astria, goddess of justice, bringing about a new fourth age of eternal spring. She is the earthly representative of the Virgin Mary, and second only to her in heaven. She is the goddess Iris, messenger of the gods, with access to her rainbow, a bridge to the heavenly world. She is the goddess Diana, her alter ego, virgin goddess of the hunt and the moon, who acts ruthlessly if she is betrayed. She is Urania, goddess of sacred love. The Queen's closeness to God is reflected in the jewellery, emphasising John Dee's concept of four things in three. We have the trinity knot at the top of the crescent moon jewel, to which are attached four pearls the cross pendant with three red stones below which a pearl hangs, and the configuration of the three eyes in the inscription, together with an R for Regina. The promise of renewal and eternal life is signalled by the endless loop designs, snake-like and derived from the Ouroboros of ancient Egypt. 
On the Queen's clothes are the emblems of ears and eyes, originated by the Egyptians, first adapted as Christian symbols of God looking after his people for the good of their souls, and then transferred to her as the guardians of her subject, wrapped within her cloak. Lastly, there is faith in the ruby heart, whether referring to good counsel, making a good choice, or merely symbolising her honesty and openness. Next, let's turn to politics. There is some slight overlap as an association with de deities gave her political power. The Queen wears an imperial closed crown, in her case constructed of pearls, black stones and enormous ruby. She is raising herself to the level of the Holy Roman Emperor. She wears the headdress of the Ottoman aristocracy, aligning herself with the Sultanate of Women in Istanbul, and she reflects the power and grace of the late Catherine de' Medici, Queen of France, in the use of the rainbow emblem. She is the figure depicted in the emblem Ragione di Stato, in command of her nation and above the law. She is intelligenza, with extensive knowledge of worldly matters, plants and animals, down to the most lowly that crawl. Her power and influence extends beyond the earth to the planets and the stars, with the principles of majesty, prudence, fortitude, clemency and eloquence, all underpinned by immovable justice. The jewelled snake on the Queen's sleeve may also reflect the Uraeus symbol of ancient Egypt, intended to portray immense personal power, not only to deter adversaries, but as a heraldic shield to protect her sovereignty. She is the Queen of Chivalry and Heraldry. She has the ultimate gauntlet. No one can challenge her. All very stirring stuff, of course. I would like to end with ambiguities, but before that I would like to show you some interesting things I discovered during my research, and these concern other versions of the portrait. This painting by an unknown artist dates from around 1603 and shows the Queen wearing similar lace, the moon of Diana above her forehead, and a similar style of cloak and mantle. A fan replaces the rainbow and she is holding gloves in her left hand. The jacket is plain and has embroidered bands of decoration running down the front and down each sleeve. Janet Arnold describes weeping eyes, flowers, arrows through hearts and caterpillars which are not visible at this resolution. You can just see an eye and a flower in the enlarged view on the left and the strip of embroidery from a glove from the period gives some idea of how it might have looked. The whereabouts of the portrait is at present unknown, and I've been unable to locate a high-resolution image. Lightening the image actually brings out more detail. The Queen has a much more severe look and has a thin, older face. The pattern of the lace is very similar to the rainbow portrait. The pendant jewel is again similar but not identical, as is the knot in the long pearl necklace and the earring. Note also the absence of the Ottoman headdress and the serpent from the left arm. There are no eyes or ears on the mantle, but it falls in a way almost identical to the rainbow portrait. There are far fewer and less obvious secondary creases, none of which look like mouths. The adornment of her hair is similar in design, with four roses and the moon of Diana, together with the droplet pearls. The five pearls around the red stone are replaced with fleur-de-lis. And lastly, the fan. This is of a fixed type and was a symbol of wealth, often adorned with multicoloured feathers and jewels. Here it appears pure white, a symbol of purity, and has six feathers in two rows. Now here are two very similar portraits of the Queen from around 1570, one in Bristol and the other at Yale University. In both cases she is holding a jewel in her left hand. It consists of three classical figures mounted around a large pearl. Now look again at the fan. Top left is the jewel from the 1570 portrait 
bottom left is the fan handle. In the 1603 portrait, around 27 years later, the top of the jewel has been cut off and transplanted onto the handle. What this tells us is that the artist had access to the vast wardrobe of robes and to the Queen's artificers who could adapt and modify precious items. These jewels were real. But what are we to make of this painting? Is it a work in progress or was it done by one of Marcus Gearhart's students? What it does tell us is that the rainbow portrait may not, may not have come out of the blue. It may have evolved from something simpler. Now I'm going to tell you something even more interesting. This portrait is really quite strange. It's attributed to the school of Marcus Gearhart the Younger and is said to be of Lady Arbella Stewart. It was sold at Sotheby's for £32,000 in 2014. Here is an enhanced view. The subject is wearing a floral jacket, although the flowers appear to be all of the same type which I suggest are roses, complete with a stem and leaves. Her hair hangs down in two rather than three spirals. On the lace collar we have a gauntlet and on the left arm we have a serpent, this time light brown with dark spots, perhaps an adder. It's coiled in a similar way to the rainbow portrait. The jewel hanging from her necklace has the same looped pattern but lacks the central stone. In the headdress we have the same pattern as the rainbow portrait of four flowers and pearls in a row. The crescent of the moon of Diana is there along with what appears to be a small crown from which emerge feathers that reach right across to the right. Here is the face in close-up. The subject is certainly not the queen, portrayed either young or old. There is however a distinct resemblance to Lady Arbella Stewart and who, you might ask, is she? Well, it's rather complicated, but in summary, she was born in 1575, the granddaughter of Bess of Hardwick and Charles Stuart, Earl of Lennox. She was the cousin of James VI of Scotland, niece to Mary, Queen of Scots, and a distant cousin of Elizabeth I. Some say that she had more of a claim to the English throne than James. Her inheritance from the Scottish side of the family was withheld from her, such that she spent her young adult life at Hardwick, where her grandmother gave her an education fit for a princess. After the death of the Queen, she joined the court of James I, although she described it to be ridiculous and wicked. She married William Seymour in 1610, and he was sent to the Tower, and she was put under house arrest. Following an abortive attempt to flee to France, Arbella herself was committed to the Tower, where she died in 1615 at the age of 39. There are two intriguing emblems. On the left is an enlargement of the bottom corner of the collar. Above the red flower is a row of pearls and a blue-green object, which appears to be an emerald. This may have been part of the jewels of the Lennox family. Next to it is a sprig which looks like rosemary, a symbol of resemblance. It makes an appearance in tragic scenes in both Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet. This is another painting said to be of Arbella, which was sold in Sotheby's in 1961. The whereabouts of this painting is also unknown. I apologise for the poor quality of the image, but it's the best that I could find. You can see that it has a serpent embroidered onto the left sleeve and just to the right of it a heart. The coiling of the snake is similar but not identical to the rainbow portrait. On the other sleeve are what might appear to be armillary spheres. So we have the Queen in the same pose but without the emblems and we have two paintings of Arbella Stuart with a serpent and other important similarities to the rainbow portrait. I've looked through all of the reference books and I can find that there is no trace of use of these emblems in anyone else. So what is going on? I can only assume that Arbella was seen as a rival to James for the throne of England and the painting shown might just have been demonstrating her virtues allied to Elizabeth. In this painting, the elements were, I think, copied from the rainbow portrait. 
However, rather than a resplendent figure, we have a diminished woman wearing what appears to be an adder on her sleeve. She is shown as a maiden, although she was married in 1610, and perched on her head as an incomplete crown. Is this the image of a woman who could have been queen, perhaps painted after her death as a memorial in remembrance to her? Now let's turn to those ambiguities. Unfortunately, there is no guidebook to the rainbow portrait and the meaning of its elements is open to interpretation, just as in the way I've described. However, there are some things about it that are distinctly odd, possibly hinting at ambiguity. Whether or not this is intentional is open to question. The first is the identity of the artist. The quality of the work and the style points to Marcus Gearhart's The Younger. But why, in perhaps arguably his greatest achievement, did he not sign it? It could be argued that for some reason he did not want to be associated with it. Alternatively, as suggested by Sir Roy Strong, it may have been cut down in the process and the signature removed. To be fair, he didn't sign all of his works. The Queen wears the headdress of a bride and her hair is down. Why would she wish to be portrayed in this way at the end of her reign? The explanation may lie in the timeless allegory of the portrait. The bridal headdress may represent her at a time in her life when she claimed to be wedded to the country. The depiction of mouth-like structures on the gown is distinctly odd. It's inconceivable that the artist did this by mistake. There are no mouths featured in the emblem books. Once more, the mouths appear tortured and distorted. Steven Steinberg has opined that the mantle has been turned inside out to reveal the inside not normally on view. A veil of secrecy. This could be read as people or things kept secret of which nothing is spoken. The eye viewing her left hand would seem to indicate that these elements are living. The most intriguing element is of course the rainbow. Why on earth is the Queen grasping a rainbow with no colour in it? This all depends how you interpret the inscription. In spite of the beautiful display of the portrait, it did not portray the Queen as she was. Her reign was coming to an end with no known successor. If we take the inscription at face value, no rainbow without the sun, then if Elizabeth is the sun, you would expect the rainbow to be colourless when she dies. Yet she appears to be very much alive. Or is she? From the mythological viewpoint, the rainbow is a bridge with the gods, a mechanism for Iris to transport herself between the gods and humanity. Are we therefore looking at the Queen about to embark on that journey, leaving behind an image of all her values and achievements? Or has she already gone and we are left only with her image, i.e. the portrait? Let me take you right back to something we considered at the very beginning, the darkened palace with its arches, and remind you that one of the Latin words for rainbow also means arch. The arch of the rainbow mirrors that of the arch of the palace, with the queen and the inscription in between. Both arches have lost their colour, but in different ways. To my mind, this is strong evidence that the queen was dead. The inscription can be interpreted in other ways, particularly if the homophone of rainbow is employed, so the text will now read, no rainbow without the sun. Once again, this might fit best if she were already dead. While speaking of homophones, another interpretation put forwards is that sun can be read as sun in offspring, i.e. no rainbow without the sun. As I'm sure you're aware, there's a series of so-called Prince Tudor theories in which the Queen had son or sons whom she failed to recognise as her successors. From my reading, it's possible that she had children with either Admiral Thomas Seymour or Robert Dudley, but the evidence is scant and therefore weak. It's possible that Henry Rosalie was her son by Edward de Vere. Here the evidence is much stronger, but not conclusive. I've looked very closely at the painting at this stage and been unable to identify any other significant clues which point to the painting carrying seditious messages about the Queen, such as seen in the other painting we are about to look at. 
Now what's puzzled me from the very start of my journey is the similarity of the rainbow portrait to that other painting and I'm sure you'll know the one to which I refer. And here they are together. The rainbow portrait on the left and the pregnancy portrait on the right. Both timeless allegories by the same artist and painted at around the same time. If the figures are scaled from the recorded dimensions of the paintings, they overlap perfectly. Here the rainbow portrait is scaled and superimposed with 50% opacity. You can see that the pose is very similar. Now for those of you who've been following the story so far, you will know that the pregnancy portrait is full of emblems relating to Elizabeth among them pearls, pansies, phoenixes and roses. It also has strong references to Shakespeare's poem The Phoenix and the Turtle Dove. And of course it features her as her alter ego, Diana. The text of the poem in the cartouche points to a long-term plan gone wrong and Henry Rosely being her son. A number of people have commented that the faces are not the same person, while I hope to convince you otherwise. What I've done here is very carefully scaled the two faces and then overlaid one on top of the other. I've used images which I've taken myself to ensure that the camera is perpendicular to the canvas. As you watch the transition, focus on the eyes, nose and mouth. It will run back again and this time watch the outline of the right cheek and the chin of the subject. The geometry of the face is virtually identical, it's the outline that is different due to the rainbow figure having a fuller face. You have to ask yourself why on earth would the artist use the same facial features, exactly the same size figures in a very similar pose, wearing Ottoman headdress if he was not depicting the same person. Others have said that the subject of the painting is not pregnant and what I've done here is to scale and slightly rearrange the body of a slim woman standing at 45 degrees to the viewer. At this angle the full projection of the abdomen is less than on the side view. I find it hard to understand any other explanation for the shape of the gown and the way that it falls for anything other than her being pregnant. So what can we conclude from all this? Let's go back to the very beginning. You probably looked at this painting thinking, ah yes, that's the one with the eyes and ears on the front. It must be something to do with the police state. I hope by now you realise that it's much more than that. It's not only a technical masterpiece, but radiates all of the attributes of the Queen as Gloriana, which means glorious grace, and all of her achievements as Empress and ruler of her people for 45 years. She is the sun at the centre. All of the theories about when the Queen was presented with the painting seem to me to be just speculation. We can only make a judgment of what is in front of us. In other words, the Queen grasping onto a colourless rainbow. This leads me to suggest that she is already dead. The background of the palace is in darkness, it's colourless. This is a celebration of her life. This is no rainbow, just a monochrome shadow. The pregnancy portrait, which I believe was set in the gardens of Nonsuch Palace, casts her in the role of the virgin goddess Diana, who against all odds is pregnant. I'm drawn to the conclusion that this portrait was also painted after the Queen's death. It is, if you like, the flip side of the coin. The person is the same, but the narrative is different. It is about bitter failure rather than success. She failed to ensure the Tudor succession. One face of the coin has been revered as the icon of Gloriana, the other tucked away out of sight until recently. I believe that the commissioner of the pregnancy portrait was Edward de Vere, who wrote under the pen name William Shakespeare. He had close links with Sir Henry Lee, the patron of Marcus Gearhart's, from his jousting days, so he could easily have engaged the artists. It's also possible that he contributed the inscription on the rainbow portrait and the eyes, ears and mouths on the Queen's clothing, which I have suggested were an addition by the artist. 
Well, it's been a long journey, but I thought it important to look at the portrait in as much detail as possible, drawing on as many sources as possible. I'm very happy to be corrected in anything I've proposed. I present it to stimulate thought and discussion and not as a fixed, unshakable view. Once again, thank you very much for watching and remember, it pays to keep an open mind and don't be swayed by those with something at stake. I'll leave you with this as a closing thought. Who would be clever enough to come up with such an ingenious inscription with so many possible interpretations?